Hello and welcome to a brand new series of Undercurrent as Perth recovers from Chogham. My name is Christy Mollica and I'm your new host and I'm certainly very glad of your company here this evening. Well, some say there is a lack of funding for science research in Western Australia. Nikita Dixon has the story. The science research community was outraged in April when $400 million was rumoured to be cut from their funding. While the funding cut didn't eventuate, there are still many research organisations struggling to make ends meet without government support. A small research organisation based in Joondalup has been devoting hours of their time towards creating a rehabilitative program for those suffering from Huntington's disease. What we would like to do is to take people with Huntington's disease, which is a progressive neurological disorder, and see if we can impact on the progression of the disease by uh, giving them as much mental and physical stimulation as we can uh, to see whether it can correct some of the um, impairments to their brain function and their body function. How many lives are you improving with this program at the moment? Well, there are only 23 people in the program at the moment. Um, I shouldn't say only 23, they're very important people. But um, it won't be limited to just those 23 people because whatever we glean from this research project will be applicable to other people with Huntington's around the world. Their hard efforts have already changed the lives of several participants. People like Jan who have families, careers and lives of their own which have been changed forever by the genetic disease. She's now been involved in Joondalup's intervention program for three months and has already noticed the progression of her symptoms in slowing down. Jan, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the program and, and how it has helped you? Oh, well, it's mainly gym work, so you go to the gym and build up your core strength. How do you feel thinking that perhaps this might not go ahead in future? Oh, no, I'm, yeah, di very disappointed if that'll happen because it's certainly been, for me, worthwhile. So I wouldn't really want that to happen. Do you think the disease is a bit unrepresented in the public? Oh, yes. Um, the average person has no idea about Huntington's disease. They might say, oh, yes, I think I've heard of that. But they associate it with Parkinson's disease. And um, it's far worse than that. Does it concern you that perhaps a program like this might not be able to go ahead without the funding required? Oh, very much. Very much. I can see it's a real benefit for Jan. She's uh, enjoying it and um, yes, it's helping to um, make her physically stronger and that can only be a benefit. Finding volunteers to put in the hard yards for the program is never easy though. Students like Travis Crookshank are hard to come by with many options to focus their research on programs that have the support of the health department. So how did you get involved in this in the first place? I was approached by my two supervisors um, and coming from an exercise background with human biology, um, they saw it fit to invite me onto a project like this because they thought I could make an impact um, to such a program. And what was it that drew you to the program? Um, I've always had an interest in um, degenerative diseases and, and specifically um, I like to help individuals and, and I think this, this is a, a really, really good program to actually help people with Huntington's disease because they're often not recognised within the wider neurodegenerative populations. We're constantly applying for grants all the time, um, Jenny and Mel, myself, and um, obviously our, our affiliated associations. And it's, it's a constant battle. You're always trying to get funding and, and, and funding means that we can keep uh, going on with this program and, and unfortunately uh, a ceasing of funding means that a program such as this would actually uh, cease to go on. And I think that that would be devastating to the patients and I think that would be devastating to the research team. We always need more funding in research, but um, particularly with Huntington's disease, because there's no cure and there's no way of slowing or stopping the disease, people are treated with um, pharmacological intervention to, to try and mask or uh, help them with some of the symptoms. But really they have a 20-year cycle of degeneration and they need our help and the only way we're going to do that is to do the research and try and find ways that we can help them. With plenty of success already, the program is leading the way in Huntington's disease rehabilitation on an international level. 
It's also providing emotional support and adequate information to the minority group of people suffering the disease. While funding for these projects remains a low priority for the federal government, it will be up to just a few to continue working long hours for little pay in the hope for a cure. I'm Nikita Dixon for Undercurrent. Last week there was a flash mob here in Perth, only this time it was for a very worthy cause. Take a look. and they're giving a voice to the thousands of children in Australia affected by domestic violence. Recently, the Global Good Foundation held a minute of noise to raise funds and awareness for the cause. As part of the event, more than 100 local performers clambered on board to launch a flash mob upon the unsuspecting public. What started with a small girl unnoticed by the crowds was within minutes a large-scale performance featuring dancers from across the state. Their message was clear, domestic violence is unacceptable. Statistics show one in every five children witness domestic violence in our country. Around 80% of those children then go on to repeat the cycle later in life. The Minute of Noise has already been celebrated around the world despite finding its beginnings just three months ago in WA. Okay, the Global Good Foundation started in 2007 and it was formed by Tennille Bentley and basically what we do is we provide um, ongoing support for people who have been affected by domestic violence after the initial crisis period. Uh, the Minute of Noise campaign is all about letting kids know that they do have a voice and that it is okay to speak out about situations of domestic violence or anything that's bothering them. And what we're doing is we're approaching what is a very delicate and controversial topic in a way that is safe friendly and age appropriate and the kids get excited about and relate to as well. The Global Good Foundation started in 2007 but the Minute of Noise campaign has only just started about three months ago so it's all still new and we're excited that it's gained so much attention so quickly. And how fun was the flash mob? It was really fun. Can you tell me a bit about the day? Um, well we started off with the flash mob and I started it off and then I was in it throughout the whole thing. What did you have to do? Um, I had to pretend to cry so people would come and comfort me. And then we watched the other bigger girls dancing and then we all got up and did a minute of noise and then did the dance that we just did. And then we all went off as if nothing happened. How was the flash mob? Um, really fun and exhausting but fun because it's all for a good cause. So uh, It's pretty much just encouraging kids to speak out against domestic violence. Just love them, uh, they think it's normal or they're too scared to talk out so that's our main aim. It's really starting to gain momentum now. We had our first two international events on the weekend in South Africa and England and we've got a number of schools, rotary clubs, girl guides and different organisations all signing up to be part of it. So we're really excited that it's going throughout Australia and also global as well. Do you know anyone that's been affected by childhood domestic violence? Uh, yes, actually, lately um, there's a couple of people that I found out about and I just hope that they uh, listen to our kind of campaign and they know that it's OK to speak out. So the Minute of Noise basically symbolises the ending of the silence and shame that's often associated with domestic violence. So on the day we go in, we speak to the kids about domestic violence but in an age-appropriate way and then we encourage them to make as much noise as they can for one minute, which generally involves screaming or shouting, although some schools have been more creative. We've had some musical numbers, we've had an orchestra randomly play instruments, and we've had some choirs take part. So groups can be as creative as they like with it. Um, and then we video them, the footage is then uploaded to YouTube, and they challenge other groups to take part too. Just three months in, the Minute of Noise looks set to make waves around the world, all in the name of preventing childhood domestic violence. I'm Nikita Dixon for Undercurrent. Earlier this week, the world's population hit 7 billion for the first time. Janae Tomlinson asked the public, is this really cause for concern? Mr. Simon. Cutest that I've ever seen. Bum, 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 bum. Give him two lips like roses 
Dancing Clover. Bum, bum, bum. The road recently hit a record population of 7 billion. This has caused some lobby groups to raise concern over how this amount of people will affect the Earth's resources. We hit the streets of Perth to see what you think. You think we're too overpopulated? Quite possibly, to be honest, yeah. Ah, uh, in certain places, but in other places not. I think so. I think that it's sort of getting that way. Seven billion does seem a lot of people. Ah, uh, you can't help it. It's natural. The population will always grow. Yeah. I think it's a very hard thing to try to solve because you can't exactly stop people from, you know, from breeding. Yeah, it's a bit worrying because, yes, we are seven billion. But out of those seven billion, how many people are actually living above the poverty line? How many people of those are actually being able to have a, a proper life, you know? I mean, when I went to school, uh, we had four billion, now it's seven billions. And yeah, sometimes it will be too much. Do you think um, that maybe, do you worry about the resources and? Not really, no, but I mean, I do worry that we're uh, overpopulated, yeah. It doesn't matter if the world's overpopulated. Like, the world was made to be populated and populated and populated. Do you worry about the world's resources? Uh, probably water and energy, yeah. Food resources, uh, energy resources, I mean, they're all uh, dwindling, so... Uh, I think we'll have enough resources. I mean, we've done pretty well in the last, like, couple of hundred years, so I think we're doing all right. We only have one Earth, right? Everything is not... Nothing is infinite. Everything will last until a certain point in time. So sustainability is right now a question that definitely we cannot avoid. Do you think we should limit the amount of children each family can have? No. I think yes, but it would have to be very carefully done. I think one children for one family, it's enough. I think the major issues are in the underdeveloped countries and I'm not sure you can do anything about that. Do you think we should introduce a limited amount of children per family? Um, yeah, maybe for other nationalities. I think for Australians it's okay. <laughs> well, perhaps in the poorer countries, yeah. Yeah, they, they had a good impact in China um, with the uh, one-child policy. Some countries like China, you know, they definitely, well, they need it. Can you imagine China right now if they didn't have that one-child policy? How many billions of people would be, like, probably starving just because, you know? Whether or not, I mean, that's something that you can uh, blanket across the world. Uh, I don't know. But it's something to think about, sure. Yeah. There's always going to be room for more people. And if there isn't, I'm sure they'll figure out some weird thing in space or something, like build something on the moon. So yeah. Fly me to the moon. Let me play among the stars. It appears that most of you agree that we should focus on slowing down the world's population growth and increasing the sustainability of the Earth's resources so there's something left for generations to come. I'm Janae Tomlinson, reporting for Undercurrent. As always, it's great to hear your thoughts. Well, don't go away, stay with us, as after the break, there'll be more Undercurrent. Undercurrent sponsored by John Hughes in Victoria Park. Choose your station before you choose your program. Absolutely. Hello and welcome back to Undercurrent. Now last week during Chogham, a group of protesters were at Perth Airport calling on the heads of government for more refugee rights. Nikita Dixon has the story. for more than a decade now over the treatment of our asylum seekers. While the federal government is at a loss for a solution, the people of Perth have taken it upon themselves to protest for a better way. These are mental illness factories. Daily, asylum seekers are physically assaulted by Serco officers. We know that within the detention network, Circos, officers, are engaged in sex for favours. We have rapes in detention being covered up. We have assaults in detention being covered up. And we have people being called by number, not by name, and that is a form of violence against innocent people that must stop. And that's why we're here today. My dad, he's, he's a government worker. My brother is a a medical student. They are the normal people. They the Sri Lankan army come to the house 
and they show it to my family. These are people who are in many cases physically and mentally traumatised by experiences of war and or torture, as well as the hazards of getting here in the first place. They deserve better. They need uh, mental health care, they need looking after, they certainly don't deserve to be behind barbed wire. Tamil people feel threatened when they get up and speak in public and tell the truth about what's happened in Tamil Elam because there are people from the Sri Lankan government who turn up at public meetings and film them and will target their families back there. That's the reality of this, that stuff. And it doesn't just happen in Tamil Elam, it happens in Iran, it happens in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, it happens all over the place. Well, it's very important that um, we recognise that people in detention centres, refugees, are you know, not illegal, uh, they've committed no crime, so they're innocent people being locked up indefinitely. And that's in contrast to a world where the top 1%, the ones who can, the corporate rich can fly around anywhere they want, any place they can go to this, this five-star hotel, that five-star hotel, and in practice there are no barriers. But we're putting out barriers in front of desperate people that are fleeing persecution and need our help. What we've seen over the last couple of months is the Gillard government in this extraordinarily misguided attempt to chase the polls that aren't even really there, served up an immigration detention policy so breathtakingly offensive that even Tony Abbott couldn't vote for it. <laughs> Colin Barnett found it too extreme. When I meet people for the first time, when they're newly arrived, they're usually well, happy and healthy mentally. And I watch in horror as week after week, month after month, year after year, people start to fall apart until people get to the point of poor Shuti last week, Tuesday night, who in desperation finally snapped and took his own life. We need to go back to the original proposal uh, and the way that it used to work, which is people are assessed for health and security concerns and then released into the community, and that is really where the process should stay. If the government wants to get these centres out of the media, people killing themselves, people torching the place, people vandalising and people taking these desperate acts of self-harm, get them out. It's not much more complicated than that. in this detention center uh, it's really very terrible uh, because every every day we see the same fence same people we don't know what's going on outside I can see a future where one day these detention centres are going to be closed, these detention centres are going to become history. One day we're going to treat our brothers and sisters with the humanity they deserve. With the public invested so heavily in the rights of asylum seekers, the onus is now on the government to act. I'm Nikita Dixon for Undercurrent. But I'm not Well, in our next story, Sarah Miller went out to Carousel Shopping Mall to discover a rather interesting way of raising money for the homeless. Round, round, get around, I get around, yeah, get around. We're down here at Tomato Lake for the HD Streetwise Adventure on Wheels Car Rally, which raises money for the homeless. Behind me, the sausage chisel is getting underway, and the rallyers should be here any moment for the big finish. <laughs> How long have you been doing the event for? This is the fourth one, so we've been doing it for two years now. This is my fourth car rally. I've been doing this with Shelley since we first started, and it's just getting bigger and better every time. We do it every March and October, and all proceeds go towards helping the homeless youth. It's for all about the kids. It's to help the kids out in the street. People just don't realise how many, how many kids actually live on the street. So over 3,500 homeless people in Perth alone. Set up HD Streetwise about nine years ago when I worked at St John of God. We've got a lot of other activities that we do. And the Venture on Wheels was going to be a one-off, but it was so successful that we've been doing it ever since. How many cars usually participate each year? Uh, between 15 and 30. We've got 18 cars. 
uh, with about three or four people in each car, so pretty good, we're happy. And what went into planning today's event? Many weeks of planning, the last six months and the last week's been pretty hectic. A lot of work behind the scenes. And um, how much money are we hoping to raise here today? Hopefully around 2000 And why a car rally, I have to ask? It's fun. <laughs> it's exciting. Everybody loves it. Yeah, it's just great. It's just great to be involved. We start out here at Carousel and we end up at a hidden destination. Along the way there's lots of clues, cryptic clues, and there's lots of activities, questions to answer, and there's about five checkpoints where people get up and their inner child comes out in them. So uh, It was a bit, bit, bit tricky, very hard. Um, you have to really use your brain to the questions and everything. Great fun. A bit stressful to the start with once you get, you know, like trying to work out what yeah. you've got to do and get into their heads on, on what they were thinking when they were making the route. And how does it feel to be the first car in today? Shocked because we got completely lost, didn't know where we were going. Yeah, we thought we were going to be the last people. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was pretty fun. Yeah? And is it your first time doing the Adventure on Wheels? Yeah. yeah. Will you be coming down again next year? Oh, for sure. For sure. Yep. Yep, it was great. So it was good. Everybody enjoyed it, yeah. We had everyone involved. Kids, grandparents, everybody. Everybody was having a go. Everybody oh, loved it. It was good fun, yeah. It's a good family fun day, it involves everyone. Even when we get to the end destination, there's games. It's family orientated, so we're encouraging the inner child to come out and we're encouraging the family to do something together while we're working on helping the homeless. So it's a win-win, it's fantastic. We always take my car, cause it's never been beat And we've never missed yet with the girls we meet well, it's been a lovely morning down here at Tomato Lake, such a great event because it involves the whole family and raises money for such a needy cause. If you would like to take part in Adventure on Wheels, visit the HD Streetwise website for more information. I'm Sarah Miller, reporting for Undercurrent. Each week on the show, Perth lawyer John Hammond will sit down for a good old chat with a prominent Perth personality. But first, John Hughes has something to say. Undercurrent sponsored by John Hughes in Victoria Park. Choose your station before you choose your program. Absolutely. Gary, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, John. At the Court Wine Bar today? Yeah, why a not? A place you're fairly familiar with? It's a real journalist establishment, the Court Wine Bar. I mean, it's died off a little bit. I think I blame the internet, but this is a real journo's pub. We'll start off with a few light-hearted questions, Gary. You have a nickname around the town in journalism as Disco. Can That's you explain right. why that is? That came about in about uh, 1992. I was at a... Um, a journalist seminar we called it. It was actually a bit of a, uh, a weekend down in Pemberton for the wine festival. So it was a disco theme, there was a disco ball and I think by about 11.30 at night I might have cut loose on the dance floor. And from that day on I got named uh, Disco by one journalist and it kind of spread. You've won a number of prizes um, for your work in journalism. What would you say has been your proudest moment in journalism? There's a story I did about a baby that uh, died, a baby called Wade Scale who died in a bathtub and we took that story and we looked at other issues around it. We found that there was a massive problem within the child uh, protection um, area of Western Australia and as a result of the stories that we ran at the Western Australian, $132 million was committed by the state government to address some of the issues with uh, child protection and the negligence that was involved and so I think if I look back, that's the one job. What is it you like best about the City of Perth? It's an easy place to live. It's almost a lazy type thing to say, but Perth, for all its faults in terms of being somewhat of a backwater and not, not understanding whether they should open shops on a Sunday or on a Wednesday night or a Thursday night, I've got a couple of kids. It's a very easy place to bring up children and live. The climate's good. Uh, the cost of living's good. Um, what I hate about Perth is the controversy that arrives when anything, something different's going to happen. Choggum. Everyone sort of just shouted down the whole Choggum thing. Choggum as an organisation and what it achieves, zero. But putting it on in Perth, showing we can do it, advertising ourselves to the world, promoting ourselves to the world, I reckon it's a great thing. Um, it's just 
it's the things that don't happen in Perth and don't happen fast enough that frustrate me. It's Perth just seems to slowly but surely get there. But, but isn't one of the good things about Perth that it is so quiet? No. And we're not overpopulated? No, 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 that's not one of the good things about Perth. Not that we're not overpopulated, but because it's quiet, no, definitely not. There just needs to be more. Um, there just needs to be more places to go. Well, what about the waterfront plan for the city of Perth? Yes, all of that. Horrendous. Horrendous. Hor as the plans that I've seen it, absolutely horrendous. I'm surprised like, to hear you say that. Well, no, You've I'm just spoken about development, now you're saying it's horrendous. I'm saying that what they're planning is horrendous. Why don't they just put markets up and invite people to come down and enjoy the foreshore without having to build cucumbers? What about and... dropping the road so that there's complete access to the yep, river? Yep, I agree with that. Yeah. Any aspirations for politics? No, I've never had any aspiration for politics. I've seen too many politicians that go into, into Parliament with great intentions and turn out to be just like the others. They do and, nothing. And, they look after their own position. Gary, you've just seen so many come and go, haven't you? But you're still in the newspaper and they're not. Yeah, I, yeah I've managed to, to hang around <laughs> like a bad smell and just... <laughs> you, you, you find that as you go on in newspapers, you can, you can kind of do things differently. You can reinvent yourself a little bit. I've been doing Inside Cover for the last year, which is a cold which you know has a bit of a following whether I'll keep doing it for much longer I don't know but you know you you do those things to keep yourself interested find a way to to, to, to tackle your profession and and it works um, just one personal question if I may Gary and who has been the greatest influence on your life as a journalist as a journalist yes it's gonna be a cliche mm -hmm. but Woodward with what they did with the whole um, all the president's men and the, the Nixon scandal it's something that I look in my generation I'm not saying that the next generation will but certainly the way that they exposed how a president had misused office and the way they had to go about it there was no Twitter there was no Facebook there was no internet they had to do it through real journalistic means and that's using a telephone knocking on people's doors from that point of view if you're asking me about the greatest success story of journalism in my era, I'd have to say what Woodward and Bernstein did with the whole Nixon scandal. Well, sadly, that brings us to the end of yet another episode. I'm Christy Mullica. I look forward to seeing you next week, same time, same place, for more Undercurrent. Mm -hmm.